Last weekend, Pastor John managed to escape and take some much needed leave outside of the Waikato Level 3 restrictions. So John, when you get to see this, we hope that you are enjoying your freedom. I'm sure there are a number of school children that are jealous at the moment. Last week, our midweek programs were slowly starting up again and we were all thinking Level 1 was right around the corner. But this week, we are back in Level 3. So can I encourage you, why don't you call somebody this week? Maybe reach out to someone you have not seen for a while. Many of us may feel isolated, but being in regular contact with others is a simple way we can help others feel connected. Prayer is an important part of the Christian journey with Christ. The church has a bi-weekly Zoom prayer meeting on Thursday evenings, and our next one is scheduled for Thursday the 21st of October. There's a great way to pray for the church and those in need. You can contact Nikki Nunn for details on how to join. Another prayer opportunity is the Alpha Global Kingdom Come prayer event aiming to pray for the church and its leaders. In New Zealand, this is scheduled for the 12th of October at 5 p.m. for 45 minutes. And you can contact events at alpha.org.nz for more details. Remember, with John away, any pastoral needs can be directed to Olivia at ohitchcock at hcbc.nz or call 021 765 788. You can also contact the church office at reception at hcbc.nz for any other inquiry.
Today we're carrying on with our messages in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, looking at the seven churches of Asia Minor. Our church of interest today is Philadelphia, and I've called this message Philadelphia the Faithful Church. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a perfect church that didn't have any problems? I can imagine if there was such a church, it would be absolutely crowded to overflowing every Sunday. Every person who has a problem would want to go to that church. But as the saying goes, you and I had better not go to that church because the moment we do, we'd spoil it and no longer be perfect. Churches struggle because they're made up of imperfect, sinning people. Churches not a place for people who have no problems or no weaknesses. Rather, the church is made up of faltering, imperfect people who long to have true fellowship together and who long for the strength and the mercy and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to fill their lives. The church at Philadelphia, like all churches, had weaknesses and imperfections, and yet the Lord Jesus didn't even point out one of those weaknesses or imperfections. He didn't mention even one imperfection. Rather, the Lord commended them on their faithfulness and their loyalty. The congregations of Smyrna and Philadelphia were the only two of the seven churches of Asia Minor who never received a rebuke from the Lord. But this I have against you. Sure, they they would have had their fleshly struggles because they're human, just like you and I. But the, the Christians at Philadelphia were faithful and obedient, serving and worshiping God and listening to his voice and listening to what the Spirit of God was saying to the churches. They were the loyal church. They were the faithful church. The church in Philadelphia was about 50 kilometers from Sardis. You went up a valley, up a river. It was on the same imperial postal route. It was built on the border of where three countries meet, Mycenae, Lydia, and Phrygia. Philadelphia was also built on the edge of a volcanic region which gave it very, very fertile soil, perfect for vineyards and for the wine industry. And so naturally the Greek god of choice was Bacchus or Dionysius, the the god of strong drink. The city was also built to spread the culture of Greece. Quite interesting. It was It was designed as a missionary city. It was designed as a missionary city of of Greek culture to the surrounding area. It was kind of the gateway of Greek culture to the east. The name Philadelphia means brotherly love. It's made up of two words, philio, which means love, and, and adelphos, which means brother. And the church of Philadelphia certainly lived up to that name brotherly love. They had a deep love for one another that came from their deep love for the Lord Jesus Christ. The letter to the church at Philadelphia was a very short letter. They're all short letters, actually, just these very short and to the point, dictated by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, written by the Apostle John, who towards the end of his life was being held captive on the Isle of Patmos. Now, The letter was totally positive. There's no mention of sin, no mention of corruption. There is no mention of, I have this against you. As a reward for their loving faithfulness, for the believers at Philadelphia, the Lord sent a loving letter offering strong promises of provision and protection. And so Let's read together Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, the one who has the key of David, the one who opens and no one shuts, the one who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those 
of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar of the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, we see, first of all, the Lord's designation of himself. The Lord's designation of himself in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, the one who has the key of David, the one who opens... And no one will shut, who shuts, and no one opens. Here in this verse, the Lord introduces himself to the believers at Philadelphia as the Holy One, or He who is holy. And we see here first, the Lord Jesus is the Holy One. The Lord Jesus wants the believers to know that he alone is the Holy One. He he possesses the characteristics of God in his holiness. This is a title that refers to God because God alone possesses absolute holiness. And here the Lord Jesus in this title calls believers to a life of faith in him. The, the Old Testament repeatedly described God as the Holy One or, or the Holy One of Israel, for example. You remember the seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3 declared, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. To declare that God is utterly holy is to declare that he is utterly separated from sin. His character is unblemished. His character is flawless. This is what Peter was talking about in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, where Peter says, But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Just as the Lord Jesus is holy, he expects us to live separated to him in a life of holiness. But we notice also That not only is the Lord Jesus holy, the Holy One, He is also the genuine one. The Lord Jesus is genuine. That's what the word true means. Some translations there have holy and true. The word true means genuine. It's holy and true. It's a holiness that's genuine. He is genuinely holy. In other words, He's not a hypocrite. He is who He claims to be. And we understand that the combination of holiness and genuineness, we, we understand that the Lord Jesus is calling us to be that too. Holiness, genuine, genuinely separated from sin. God wants us to be holy. He wants us to be real. He wants us to be genuine, not hypocrites, not saying one thing and living another. Not pretending to be holy, but to live holiness and and separated from sin. We see also that the Lord Jesus is sovereign. Verse 7, he who has the key of David. Why do you think the Lord Jesus calls himself that? I am he who has the key of David. Now this speaks of Christ's authority in the household of God. Christ holds the keys to the doors of heaven and to God's kingdom here on earth. He holds the key. 
But this picture here goes back to a picture that we have in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, where Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, held the keys to the kingdom at that time. He had the keys to all the treasures of the kingdom. He, he had the authority to open doors and to close doors. And when he opened a door, it was open. And when, when Eliakim closed the doors, it was closed. But there's also in this picture of the Lord Jesus opening doors of service. There's this idea that, that, that he is opening doors of service. And that's what the Lord Jesus does. He opens doors and he closes doors. And when the Lord opens a door, it's open. Nobody can close it. And when he closes a door, it is totally closed. And you can't leave it open because it's totally closed. It's such a mistake to try and go through a closed door. But how many of us do that? There's no blessing when we leave or open a door that hasn't been opened by the Lord. We've got to wait on the Lord and, and listen to him to know what doors have been opened for us. But when you go through a door that has been opened by the Lord into ministry, there is untold blessing. That's the Lord's designation of himself. But we see second, the Lord's diagnosis of the church. The Lord's diagnosis of the church. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, the characteristics of this church are described in, in about four ways. These are Descriptions are characteristics of what the Lord Jesus is looking for in the church today, in our church today. This is what the Lord Jesus wants us to be. First, we notice that they had an open door. They had an open door. It was a, it was a door that was opened by God, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Lord was telling the church at Philadelphia that they had a great opportunity right in front of them. Now, now remember, it was a door that was opened by the Lord who holds the keys. Philadelphia was a city where you sort of had to go through Philadelphia to go to other places. So Philadelphia was like a door city to other places. It was a very strategic city. And so what the Lord Jesus was saying was, I have given you a door and I've put you in a very strategic place. They couldn't get to where they wanted to go unless they were prepared to go through the open door that was opened by the Lord Jesus Christ. But second, not only did they have an open door, but the Lord says they had but little power. I know that you have but little power. This is a very interesting quality. They are commended. I know that you have but little power. That doesn't sound like it makes much sense to us, does it? They were probably a small church. They were possibly a poor church. And the Lord commends them for it. You have but little power. Well, today we'd say that was a hindrance or a weakness in the church, not a strength. You have pastors today who say, you know, we just don't have enough members to accomplish God's work. You know, it's a real struggle because we just can't get the finances to do what we'd like to do as a church. I don't think I've ever heard a pastor say, what a blessing it is to have a small, poor church. What a blessing to have little strength and little power. <laughs> But do you remember what the Lord said to Paul in Corinth about this? Remember, my grace is sufficient for you. And my strength is made perfect in weakness. In his translation from the original Greek, Kenneth Weiss translates this passage like this. He says, because you have but a small amount of power. 
So what the Lord was saying here was not that they have little power in terms of numbers or finances, so that you're going to struggle to achieve what you want to achieve, and and you're just going to limp along as a small, powerless church. Rather, what the Lord was saying was that they have little strength in themselves. So the source of their power doesn't depend on themselves, but it depends on the Lord. When a church is truly dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit for its strength, then it'll belong to God alone who opens the doors. And and they will recognize those doors. You'll never recognize a door opened by the Lord unless you get down on your knees and and you listen to his quiet, gentle voice and recognize that it is he alone who is the source of your power. Spiritual power has not the slightest ounce to do with the size of your congregation or the size of your staff. Spiritual power has not the slightest ounce to do with the number of ministries that you run or the untold finances that you have at your disposal. But it has all to do with the size of your faith and your total dependence on God. See, the church at Philadelphia was a church that had a great ministry door open to them by the Lord. But they were also a church that understood that their strength, their power, came from the Lord alone. And they could never walk through that door in their own strength. They they understood the principle that God's strength is made perfect in weakness, in our weakness. God is the one who opens the door and God is the one who empowers. And and if we're not careful, when we walk through that door, if we're not careful and we don't keep our eyes on God and keep reminding ourselves of who we are in Christ, we can become deluded into thinking that it's all about us. Aren't we doing so well? Wow, praise be to God, look at us. We're a strategic denomination. We're a big church. We're the envy of other churches. Look how good we are doing. And we forget that God is the sovereign one over all the church. He's the one who opens doors and he's the one who closes doors. And it's in his power alone that the church will flourish. Thirdly, they had a commitment to God's word, and you have kept my word. They kept the word of God. The word of God had the center place in the life of the church at Philadelphia. When the word of God is not given its rightful place in the church, and and when we fail to act according to what the word of God says, the church will begin to erode. Victory in Christ will be replaced by powerlessness and defeat and and bickering and fighting. See, the word of God is our plumb line. The Bible is the final word on marriage and family. It's the final word on the church and the state. And and God has, has given very clear boundaries around the laws of of family and church and state. And if we don't know the Word of God, if we don't know what the Bible says about each of these, you'll never know when the lines are crossed and and how to respond to it. If we don't know what the Bible says concerning the church and its place in the world, then it loses its influence in the world. The Bible tells us that one of the reasons that the church at Philadelphia was so blessed was that they kept the Word of God at the center of their church. Not only did they keep the word of God at the center of their church, but they they kept the word of God in the center of their lives. They followed the word of God. They lived by the word of God. Just like old Job of old, he said, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. Also, we see here that they had not denied 
the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had not denied the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only did they have a deep, loyal love for the Word of God, but they had a deep, loyal love for the Lord Jesus Christ. (laughs) Remember that the citizens of the Roman Empire were commanded to take a pinch of incense and to burn a pinch of incense and to bow the knee and confess that Caesar is Lord. And the believers had to deny that Jesus Christ was Lord. But the believers at Philadelphia wouldn't do that. They wouldn't deny the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had a deep, loyal love for the Lord Jesus and for his word. And so, how do we measure up against the church at Philadelphia? Do we have a deep, loyal love for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and a deep, loyal love for his word? Is the word of God, his word, the plumb line of truth in your life today, regardless of how difficult it may seem to keep it? That's the Lord's diagnosis of his church. We see in the third place the Lord's declaration to his church, the Lord's declaration to his church. Verse 9, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Here the Lord makes a number of promises, and, and the first promise is this, The Lord promises to fight our enemies. As in the case of Smyrna, the Christians at Philadelphia faced the hostility of unbelieving Jews. We know from extra-biblical sources and history that there was only a very small group of Jews in Philadelphia, and we know very, very little about them. But these Jews, the few that there were, made life very difficult for the believers. These Jews rejected the Lord Jesus as the true Messiah so that the Lord declared that they were not from the synagogue of God, but the synagogue of Satan. They claimed to be Jews. They were Jews racially, they were Jews culturally and ceremonially, but spiritually they weren't Jews at all. And the Lord Jesus said they are liars. They are not Jews at all. The Lord Jesus says to the believers at Philadelphia, don't try and fight these battles in your own strength. Trust in me and I will fight the battle for you. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against cosmic powers over this present darkness and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. The Lord will fight the battles for us. But we also see that the Lord promises to keep us from the hour of trial. The Lord promises to keep us from the hour of trial. And we see this in verses 10 and 11. Look what it says. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Now, I just want to make a note here. And it's an interesting note. And I know that um, it's a kind of statement that causes uh, people to get upset. But have you ever noticed that the church is featured through Revelation right up until chapter 5, and from that point on, the church is never spoken of again in the entire book? Why is that? The reason is because from chapter 6, for the rest of the book, it speaks about the tribulation, about a time of trial that is coming. That's about a period of history when the Lord is going to pour out his wrath on the inhabitants of the earth. And that phrase, the inhabitants of the earth, is used in the sense of those who don't know Christ. But here in these verses is a promise. And in its broadest implication, that has reference to the great tribulation that is going to come upon the whole earth at the end of the church age. 
The believers of Philadelphia had overcome local trials and, and local tribulations, but here the Lord Jesus says that he's going to keep them from the universal tribulation that is going to come upon the whole world. If we accept these verses at face value, the language of these verses indicates that this is a trial of universal scope. And it's not just a local outbreak of persecution that the Philadelphian believers were going to be delivered from. It must also mean, if we take it literally, that the church will not go through that end time period of tribulation. That's what the verses seem to indicate. The promise here is not merely to be kept through the trial or to be kept within the trial or to be kept from just the trial, but from the hour of the trial. And the word that's used there is ek, out of, to be kept from, out of the trial. That is to come on the whole world, to try those who dwell on the earth. This means, at face value, the church will not go through that period of trial. Now, this period of history, this hour of trial, if it could be defined by one word, it would be the word condemnation. When God brings and pours out his wrath on mankind, it's a time of condemnation. And the Bible tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. But we also see another promise in this, the promise that he will come quickly. Verse 11, I am coming soon or I'm coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The Lord Jesus promises the church at Philadelphia that he's going to come quickly. Now you might think that the word quickly means immediately, but the word quickly does not mean immediately as we know it. Remember, what the Lord Jesus said to the church at Ephesus in chapter 2, verse 5, he said, I'm coming to remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. In other words, unless you repent, I'm going to shut down your church. That's what the Lord Jesus said. Then in chapter 2, verse 16, the Lord Jesus said to the church at Pergamum, I am coming to make war with you with the, with the sword of my mouth. And then to the church at, at Sardis, the Lord said in chapter 3, verse 3, he said, I will come like a thief, and you will not know the hour I will come to you. In each of these churches, the Lord Jesus said, I am coming to judge you. I am coming to shut you down if you don't repent. In each of these cases, the Lord was coming in judgment on those churches. But here in verse 11, the Lord says, you're not going to go through that final time of testing. I'm coming quickly to take you out. Hold fast to what you have so that no one can take your crown. This coming quickly is, is different from the coming to Ephesus and Pergamum and Smyrna and now to Philadelphia because those, those comings were in judgment. But this coming to Philadelphia, this coming quickly, appears to be deliverance from the final hour. And it means that when he comes, he'll do it quickly. Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. That's from chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. The Lord tells us, as believers, to be faithful. Hold on, so that you don't lose your reward. Hold fast. It won't be easy. But he's coming. And the question today is, are you ready for him? Are you ready for his coming? Are you ready for his return? Dear God, please keep everyone safe from COVID and from injuries. 
please let everyone have a good holiday, even in lockdown. Please help the essential workers. Dear God, thank you for everything you've given us. Please bless all the people that have lost jobs to COVID, that that they can find God through their times of trouble. Please, Lord, help that we can come together as a church in a few weeks, and please help that COVID goes away. Dear Lord Jesus, please bless the people that have been affected by COVID. I bless that they will heal through the powers of you. Please bless that the people that are struggling to get out of countries, they will make it through. Amen. As we reflect on this word of hope, we are reminded to check, is the word of God truly our plumb line? I heard it said recently that truth is very hard to find these days, and this is the environment we find ourselves in. Whether we trust those who are responsible for us, or find somebody else that has a more agreeable message, there is one thing that I know. When God's word is central to our lives, there is great peace and steadiness, even in the storms of life. When Jesus calmed the storm, his disciples went from fearing for their lives to acknowledging God's sovereignty. Who is this? They said. Is that your question today? Maybe you've known God in the good times, but now in the tough times, you're questioning who he really is. Maybe this is the exact environment that God wants us in to show us who he really is. You know, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And for those who use God's word as their plumb line for measuring truth, they will not be dismayed. Perhaps the words of the prophet Isaiah spoken to the descendants of Abraham who have placed their trust in God can also apply to us. This is what he says. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So if you've had enough of alternative truth claims, can I encourage you to take a Sabbath today from all the voices and take some time to listen to the one voice that brings peace in the storm. When you subscribe to our YouTube channel, that helps you keep up to date with our latest news. You can find small group questions at our virtual page, www.hebc.nz slash virtual. If you have prayer requests, please forward them on to jlockley at hebc.nz. And remember, all our information on giving can be found at www.hebc.nz slash giving.